Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about how do you work out how much to invest in property, shares, super and any other assets. It's a common question I get asked, uh, particularly uh, by property investors, you know, should I invest in more property or do I have enough uh, and obviously enough uh, in context of their goals, which is sometimes difficult to answer if I don't know what their goals are. Um, but it's a really good question because I think it invites people to really consider what are their long-term goals and therefore developing a strategy in order to achieve them, uh, which means then figuring out you know, what types of assets and income at, and, and return attributes, income and capital growth attributes, uh, those assets need to uh, possess in order for them to achieve their goals. So whilst it's going to be different for everyone because the starting point will be different and the end point is going to be different in terms of you know, how much income do they need to fund retirement and uh, how far away they are from uh, needing that income, so how far away they are from retirement. So that's going to be different for everyone, of course. So uh, what I wanted to do today is really just share some considerations, which I think will go a long way to kind of helping you Uh, maybe apply those to your own situation. Um, But before I do that, maybe there's a a, a couple of other things I just want to sort of clarify or point out I think would be useful uh, in context of this conversation. The first one is the general rule of thumb is that you need uh, investment assets to the value of somewhere between 20 to 25 times the amount of income that you would like to have in retirement. So For example, if you want $100,000 a year of income or or ability to spend $100,000 a year, I should say, then you really need to accumulate, say, two to two and a half million dollars of net investment assets by the time that you retire. Uh, And those assets could include equity and investment properties. So that would be the the value less uh, any outstanding loans and even providing for capital gains tax. Uh, equity in any share portfolios, obviously superannuation balances and so forth. Now that rule of thumb of 20 to 25 uh, times income is exactly that, just a rule of thumb uh, and it's probably a pretty conservative one too. Arguably you could uh, retire on slightly less in terms of investment assets but it really gives you a, a, a sense of you know, where you're heading and where you need to be. Uh, And of course, if you already have those assets, then arguably you don't need to invest in any more um, investments. However, if you're miles away from achieving that, then you really uh, want to invest in assets that are going to get you closer to that net worth uh, position as as quick as possible. So really what you want is you probably want to benefit from compounding capital growth. Whereas if um, if your assets aren't quite there, but you're pretty close, then maybe it's start, uh, a time to start thinking about more liquid assets or assets that drive uh, more income. In fact, I've got a link in the show notes to a video that I prepared about five years ago that takes you through a sort of typical life cycle of an investor. You know, why it's best to start first with investing in property, then super, then shares, then debt reduction, etc., etc. So if you want to learn more, Uh, I suggest you uh, check out that video, even though it's five years old, still very current, I think. Also, when considering the right mix of assets, you really need to consider your longevity risk. And longevity risk is really that you outlive your money. Now, of course, we don't know how long we're going to live exactly, but, you know, what we don't want to risk is, particularly later in life, um, having any financial uncertainty so if I can build a plan, you know, that, that my assets still continue to grow into retirement, then mathematically I can afford to live forever. And the chance, therefore, of uh, being in a precarious situation, financial situation later in life in my 80s or 90s or whatever it might be, uh, is greatly reduced. And so uh, in order to do that, it's really what you really typically want is a mixture of income and capital growth. So quite often people think, okay, I'm retired now, I want $100,000 of income, okay, so I need to invest in assets that are going to get me there. Well, yes and no. Uh, it's, it's possible, uh, depending on your situation, that might be achievable, but also what we don't want to do is exhaust all income, uh, because firstly, we'll, it'll invite us to invest in assets that will 
uh, maybe get eaten away uh, at from an inflationary perspective. So the value of those assets will decline over time in real in real terms, uh, and it will invite us to make a probably an inefficient uh, asset allocation. So let's think about. I'll give you an example. If you had two and a half million dollars of investment assets, and your average return was seven percent, being three and a half percent in income and three and a half percent in growth. So three and a half percent on two and a half million dollars is eighty eight thousand dollars. Now, if you need a hundred thousand dollars, for example, well, you're a little bit short there. But obviously, you're going to get eighty eight thousand dollars of capital growth as well. So therefore, we might go and sell twelve thousand dollars of our investments to top ourselves up to a hundred thousand. But it means that our investments are still growing by the net amount being seventy six thousand dollars. And, um, and at least that will help protect us against the impact of inflation. So it's a bit of a misnomer error to think, well, um, I've got a certain amount of investment assets, I need a certain amount of income, that you need all that income coming from the investments. It's really a combination of capital growth and income. Uh, and ultimately, what you want to do is have a, a really astute and balanced and diversified asset allocation in order to achieve that. Okay, so when looking at a client situation, obviously I need to sit down and figure out what is the starting point. So what is the what are their investment assets worth today, and um, and and when's retirement? So when do I need the certain or the necessary amount of investment assets? So in that context, uh, what I thought I would do is then share some considerations. So the first consideration is debt servicing costs. So. Of course, mathematically, the more you invest in property, so the more you borrow to invest in property more correctly, um, the higher, assuming you're investing in investment grade property, of course, over the long run, the the more money you make. I mean, that's a mathematically just a no-brainer, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's exactly what you should do because obviously, um, the more you borrow, the more sensitive you are to interest rate increases and really... You don't really want to be that sensitive to interest rate increases uh, when you enter into retirement because obviously your income is going to be predominantly from investment sources uh, and probably zero from personal exertion income. So you don't have that salary to sort of fall back on. Uh, And so buying another investment property today uh, for some people um, pushes them actually further away from retirement because of the debt servicing situation rather than closer to it. The other consideration too is if I overgear into property, so I borrow too much, there's a risk that it will absorb all my cash flow. And if it does that, it really um, reduces, it comes with an opportunity cost because it reduces or, or actually eliminates, if it absorbs all the cash flow, eliminates my ability to invest in other assets, whether that's investing in a share portfolio outside super or making additional super contributions, whatever it might be. If I gear to my eyeballs or gear to my maximum amount my cash flow allows me, then I'm going to put all my eggs in one basket. Now, that may or may not be a problem. It might work perfectly fine, but it's something to really consider. And I would imagine most people would be better off spreading their eggs rather than putting them in one basket. The next observation is that property tends to be a very lazy asset from an income perspective. So even if you can generate a high rental yield, not high rental yield, I would, would regard as say four to six percent, uh, for example. Pretty difficult to go over six percent. Not impossible, but difficult. Um, but if you're investing in investment grade property, which tends to or always does have a strong land value component, land really doesn't help the rental income very much. Then really, you're mostly going to end up with a net rental yield, that is the rent less expenses, of somewhere around 1%. Maybe you might get to 2% depending on the type and location of the property, but it's going to be 1% to 2%. So from an uh, after expenses perspective, it's a pretty lazy asset from an income perspective. Therefore, uh, the other consideration as well is that it's uh, illiquid. You know, you can't go and sell 10% of your investment property. You've got to sell it all or keep it all. Uh, so, uh, of course, th- there's the positives associated with uh, investing in property, which I've, I've talked about at, at length, being uh, predominantly compounding capital growth, which is really the easiest way to build wealth. But it's important to acknowledge that there are some negative attributes associated with that investment asset class also. 
Therefore, if you put all your eggs in that basket, that property investment basket, I think you'll find that perhaps the income won't be there. And as a result, you'll have to sell an asset or maybe a couple of assets, either reduce debt or create some liquidity so that you can spend some of that equity. Uh, And doing that will obviously give rise to a a capital gains tax liability, which you may or may not want to uh, crystallise. And the point being that uh, perhaps you'd be better off in that situation to invest in a combination of assets rather than concentrating all your wealth in one asset class being residential property or commercial property, whatever it might be. The other consideration would be, uh, do you want to retire before you reach your super preservation age? So, that is before you can access super. For most people, that's age 60. Um, if so, then it's uh, a wise observation to note that, you know, if you had a liquid pool of investment assets that are outside super, that that can um, help people uh, either retire in full or reduce working hours before they get to 60. So what I'm talking about, for example, is a, a share portfolio in a family trust. Uh, and the individual might be able to sell down part of that share portfolio, say if they want to retire at 55, to supplement all other investment income um, to fund living expenses and do that relatively tax effectively because they're selling you know, only portions of the uh, share portfolio and they're doing it uh, in a tax effective manner. So thinking about assets outside of super that are liquid that we can uh, either it's, they're going to derive uh, more predictable income levels and or that we can sell bits and pieces of if we need to, um, sometimes helps us give that flexibility that we're looking for. When thinking about asset allocations, that's really about you know how much to invest in property shares, super, etc. Uh, it's, it's probably best to think about it, uh, think about retirement as kind of three phases. The first phase is kind of pre-super. And it might not be uh, applicable to everyone because if you, um, uh, your goal is to work beyond 60, then it's not relevant. But for those that want flexibility, either reduce working hours or full retirement before 60, there's a pre-super kind of phase. And so in that regard, uh, given property doesn't throw off a lot of income, it's really then important to invest in assets outside of super um, and outside of property, so that is mostly shares or be shares for most people, uh, outside of super. The next phase is then uh, post-60, so when super kicks in, and then um, how long that phase lasts really depends on how much super you project you're going to have by the time you're 60. So if I'm working with someone that's in their, I don't know, late 20s, for example, well, they've got another 30 years of contributions, I'll probably have a lot of super, Whereas if I'm working with someone in their 50s and they've got relatively low super balances for whatever reason, well, I know that second phase really won't last that long. And depending on how long that uh, that second phase lasts, the, the super phase, will really inform us about what other assets do we need to invest in. So the way I see it for most people, and again, this is a generalisation, but the, if I'm investing in property today, what I'm really thinking about is trying to uh, maximise my wealth in, say, 30 years' time. Because we all know that um, you know, compounding capital growth really does most of the heavy lifting in terms of building wealth. And if we can hold a property for 10 years, we'll make a bit of money. If we can hold it for 20 years, we'll make a whole lot more money. And if we hold it for 30 years and it's the right asset, we're, we're making huge amounts of money. So you really need to hold it for you know two, three, four decades to really enjoy that that compounding capital growth. So therefore, if I'm in my 40s today and I'm investing in property, what I'm really doing is trying to fund that third phase of retirement. And that third phase of retirement is when the second phase runs out. So how long will my super last? Uh, and if my super lasts 10 years and I start drawing it at 60, then I know what I'm doing is investing today to fund 70 and beyond. Uh, So really that's a way of sort of looking at those three phases. But the point is that for most people, super is going to hopefully um, fund a material proportion of your retirement. And uh, taking that into account, it's then also important to understand the benefits of accumulating wealth in super because quite often people think oh look super they the government keeps playing around with the rules and the government's in charge I'm not really in love with the idea of investing more in super but it's kind of silly to ignore it because it's so tax effective 
And to make this point, I've got a link in the show notes to a very basic table. And what the table does is double $1 20 times. Uh, And in one uh, scenario, it doubles it uh, without any tax. And in the other scenario, it subtracts 30% for tax. So what what this table is trying to demonstrate is how insidious tax is because it really eats away at the balance. Okay, so if I take uh, $1 and then double it to 2 and then 4 and 8 and so forth and do that 20 times, I end up with a million and 48 dollars. So a million bucks. Okay, if I withdraw 30% of tax each time I double it, I end up with $40,000. So 1 million versus 40,000. And it shows, and that's doubling 20 times, so it shows how insidious taxation is in terms of eating away at returns and therefore why it's important to think about, you know, um, not putting all your eggs in one basket, of course, but having a substantial amount of wealth inside super post 60 because it really is very tax effective. So there you go. There's some of the considerations that I uh, usually take account of. Uh, when looking at someone's financial position and developing a long-term strategy uh, with respect to deciding you know, how much to have in property, shares, super, uh, and so forth. So hopefully it gives you some food for thought. Uh, maybe the best combination, you know, if I give some ranges, would be to, by the time you get to 60, uh, have uh, somewhere between 30 to 50% of your overall wealth in super, uh, maybe 20 to 30% in property, and 20 to 30% in shares or other liquid investments that generate uh, predictable or better uh, income levels than what property does. Uh, But again, it's different for everyone and um, no one asset class is better than the next. But at a portfolio level, having a combination of different asset classes in different ownership structures uh, tends to sort of balance out those pros and cons uh, and gives you the best of both worlds. Uh, So there you go. That's it for me for this week. Uh, Until next week, bye for now.